coming up on Theatre Talk. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Out on his swing or caroling, if he's still on his stilts or hiding inside his fortress of quilts, please tell him I'm here. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Reed, love the New York Post. Michael, last night I saw a powerful and original new musical at Vineyard Theater written from scratch by Greg Pierce, the lyricist, librettist, and John Kander, the composer and also co-librettist. The show is called Kid Victory and it stars an awesome cast including Brandon Flynn, Jeffrey Denman, Daniel Jenkins, and our guest, the magnificent Karen Ziemba. Thank you, Susan. Uh, uh, Greg, I don't want you to give too much away. Sure. Because this is a very dark musical, we should say, with some mm -hmm. twists and turns. Yep, that is true. But it's brand new. People don't know anything about it. So yep. can you whet our appetite for what this show's about? I can try. Um, so this show is about a 17-year-old boy who lives in Kansas who has been mysteriously absent for the last 11 months, and we don't know why. So at the beginning of the show, he comes back home um, and everybody's mystified by what's happened to him. He seems like a very different person. And uh, so his family wants him to, him to jump back into life and um, playing tennis and, and uh, school and church and all these things. Going but to he, the church social, yeah. That's right, going to the fellowship. And uh, he just can't do it. He can't do these things. Um, and he befriends this sort of town outcast, this woman who works in a uh, lawn and garden store, a sort of failing store in town. And through their friendship, we get to see, you know, fl flash back into some of the complex things that have happened to him in the last 11 months. So there's a reason why he yeah. can't quite go back to the kind of normal lifestyle that his parents want him. There is a reason, and uh, if you want to know, you got to come see the show. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> John, where did this uh, idea for this show come from? I mean, the boys from Kansas, you're from Kansas City, correct? Is right. there any uh, autobiographical elements to this show at all? Uh, only in terms of, I, I know that area, and I know the kind of towns uh, in which the, uh, his family lives. But as far as the material itself is concerned, we had such a good time working together on the landing mm -hmm. that we almost immediately wanted to go back to work again. And we thought of a number of, of possible stories. And then we became aware of articles occasionally that were written about kids who had been abducted or, or, and who were found and returned to their families. Mm. But not, they all had a great deal of information and description of what it was like, how excited everybody was when the kid returned, but none of them talked about what happened then, how somebody who's been taken out of society uh, is returned and what his life is after that. If there were descriptions of it, it, it oh, for instance, the, the abduct, abductee would say, I thought of my family and Jesus, and that's what got me through. And you know that's not true. And this is the story of somebody who returns and what he goes through in trying to come back. When you were uh, in Kansas as a child, were you in this kind of stifling, no. parochial atmosphere? No, but I, uh, no, in the city, right, you were the city the, is right. different. Everything's up to date in Kansas City, right? right, right. I swore I'd shoot the friend next minute. <laughs> the next <laughs> person who said that? <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I used to go in the, uh, on trips in the country where my father's businesses were, and 
uh, stop off in little towns. I got a feeling for life, what life was like in those towns. And then God knows there's been plenty of publicity about what they are like now. It's not a terrible place, this town. It's not like the, the worst, no. uh, most restrictive world. But it's small, it's very Christian, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a certain way of living that everybody is ex expected to uh, experience. Mm. Karen, uh, you play the mother. Uh, this is an unusual musical, I can tell from the description. Yeah. What did you make of it when you were first uh, given the script and the and the songs? Well, I, I thought it was fascinating, mm -hmm. and um, just like John is, and uh, Greg are explaining, it's it, you, you don't think about that what somebody is actually going through, and the people ex bringing this, you know, the people who have been in the town, and now he comes back, and it's like. You want to go back to the way it was because that's always the way life is. Life is very much, you know, the status quo. I'm right. This is the way things are done. This is proprietary. This is our, you know, and it's this person has changed, and it's very frustrating. And and you need to listen to that person's story and find out what is wrong with them. And sometimes people don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. They don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what my issue is. What's the style of music for this, John? Are, are, there, are there some showstopper John yes. Kander uh, tunes in there? Since we've been working together, I, I, I don't know how to say this and make it any sense, but I just feel free. I just write. Mm. I, I just uh, write whatever I feel. I don't think in terms of form. And uh, I'm having the time of my life right now. <laughs> and I, I can only say that uh, I can't stop writing. You're more prolific than ever. He's got uh, The Beast in the Jungle coming with uh, Susan Stroman and Tommy Thompson you're working yeah. on. You did the Scottsboro Boys a couple of years ago, which I loved. The Landing, this one. Karen, you've known this man since... We were just we're, talking about that. World Goes Round? It seems like yesterday. <laughs> it was, but it was, the wor it was The World Goes Round. Yeah, it was the first time we worked together in, and The World Goes Round. Right, uh, right. An evening of... Uh, it was a great off-Broadway show. Were you on roller skates, I remember? That's right. <laughs> Banjos, roller skates, you name it. Do you remember the first time you met John, and then with Fred Ebb, these legends of the musical theater? You were a young kid just beginning your career. You yes, to meet and, these guys. and I tell you know, the story um, a lot, but um, I just remember it was one of the first auditions I was at where someone who, who was an authority and who was an icon came, you know, who, which was John Kander, you know, actually stood up and came over and introduced himself and asked me, to make an adjustment on something, but he just treated me like I was royalty. I mean, it wasn't like, what else you got? You know, he was <laughs> just such a gentleman and... Uh, I'm gonna practice that. Yeah. <laughs> and you delivered. Yeah. Mm, Did yeah. you see her and go, oh, now there's, there's a talent right away? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was kind of apparent. Yes, uh, it certainly the thing is. is. But with this show, I mean, we've known each other and worked together a lot for 26 years, I figured out. Today. 26, wow. And Longer than Susan and, and me in theater talk. Yeah. <laughs> and she, uh, she started playing scenes in this, show, in this piece, and I thought, I've known this person uh. all these years, and I have no idea who she is. And I still watch, I still watch every night. You know, this is a very different Karen right. Ziemba we're seeing. This show, I was sitting there thinking, ah, oh, that John Kander, though, can write the tunes, because although your wonderful director, Liesl Tommy, has blended together the movement and very organic piece, where there's not, you're not stopping to sing. But still, I just want to read some of these song titles, because they're so theatrical, the titles. <laughs> Lord, carry me home, a single tear, people like us. I've got a feeling that's not quite true. Where is that boy? I'd rather wait. Friends forever and you, if anyone. A great song. There's a lot of just old time, not old fashioned, but old time great songs in this score. We sit backstage and just listen and watch our you know, colleagues on stage because that's one thing, John, he can't help himself. And along with Greg's lyrics, which are just so knowing and um, beautiful. Uh, they, they just know how to write a song. They know how to structure a song, but also how to make it come out of character. It's just stunning. Greg, this may be a slightly unfair question, but since John's 
great collaboration with, was with Fred Ebb. Do you ever feel Fred Ebb sitting over your shoulder when you're writing a you lyric? Know, I, I don't feel feel that. I mean, I have uh, I have um, obviously like a great admiration for Fred. For Fred, I think he's uh, unbelievable. We're just doing a, a very different thing. When we get really excited about an idea and we're working, it's just the idea is there, and we drop uh, everything else. You know, a, a, any other sort of showbiz thing, who's done what, resumes and things, and we just focus on the idea and the the problem we're trying to solve or the character, and um, that stuff falls away. I I I think it could be um, hard for me if I let that sort of. Stay there. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> he's a genius. The, theatrical legend. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, we got to wrap it up soon, John. But I want to ask you: When Fred died in two thousand and four, right? Right. Was there ever a moment you thought, "I'm not going to continue writing," or "I don't know what I'm going to do now because my no. part is there"? You just knew you were going to barrel on. I didn't. I didn't have plans. Right. But then, the great thing that happened was him. Mm-hmm. He really, really. I think extended my life. <laughs> uh, it's by Greg Pierce, John Cantor, and stars the great Karen Ziemba, Kid Victory at the Vineyard Theater. Thanks a lot for being our guest on Theater. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Pleasure. What's the point of living if your hand is always steady, if you're comatose already? What's the point of seeing trying to get Jerry Herman here for over a year now, and I'm just delighted he could be with us tonight on Theater Talk. Uh, Jerry, welcome. Thank you, and I'm equally delighted. Well, you I've know, been we, looking forward to this. Uh, gosh, hello, Dolly, Mame, La Cajo Full, Mac and Mabel. I wanted to tell you, uh, on the way over here today, I was, um, it's a true story, in the subway, and there was a young girl there whistling, I'll be wearing ribbons down my back. I tried uh, to collect a royalty for you, but I didn't want to take her lunch money. <laughs> <laughs> but it occurred to me, there must be all over the place, people whistling a Jerry Herman tune, humming a Jerry Herman tune, singing a Jerry Herman tune. It's probably the most satisfying part of, 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 of what I do to get into a, a taxi and to hear a song of mine on the radio and have the taxi driver whistle along with it and not have the vaguest idea that the man who wrote it is sitting in the back. I, I just sit there and grin. Where does this gift for this melody that catches in everyone's mind the first time they hear it come from? Do you have any sense of how you come up with these gorgeous I, I, tunes? I honestly have not the vaguest idea because it's all in here and it was never studied, it was never anything that I went to school for. I went to school to learn how to be an architect and a, and a designer. Mm-hmm. And I started writing songs, and my mother made me go and take those songs to Frank Lesser, who she got an appointment with through a, she didn't know him, but she had a hairdresser and a somebody, you know, it was one of those, uh, 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 I call it the Mother Mafia. <laughs> and and uh, she made an appointment and actually f- had to force me to go. Really? I said, I said he's going to laugh at me. I'm a kid. And How old were you? Oh, I must have been 17, you know. Mm-hmm. And I had these, these, these songs that I thought were, were cute, mm. but that's about the strongest adjective I could use uh, uh, about them. But she's, she, of course, being a mother, uh, wanted me <laughs> to show them to, to Frank. So I, I went, and he changed my life. He said, you've got to go to the musical He changed theater. my life in, in, in the course of about three hours. He kept me there all afternoon. Did he teach you something? Did he tell oh, you? What did he? he? He was such a mentor to me. He, that afternoon, he, he took out a, a, a he had a, a uh, pads of, of, of very long, like artist paper on his desk, mm-hmm. and lots of colored uh, uh, crayons and, and, and markers. 
And he drew a freight train. And he drew a bright red caboose. And he said, the reason you know how to write songs instinctively is that you always have a caboose on your songs. And he said, never forget that. And he quoted his own, I'm going to get you on a slow boat to China, mm. all to myself alone. And he said, the all to myself alone doesn't come until that last moment and explains the song. And, and that's the caboose. And you know, I almost never write a song that doesn't have a There'll be no Blue Monday in your Sunday clothes, which is the, the that, capper yes. of that. <laughs> yes. Or I won't send roses, which goes through a whole litany of why this girl should stay away from him. And then the last line is, I won't send roses, and roses suit you so. Boom. Caboose. Boom. <laughs> That's the caboose of all time. But you're not a trained musician. I'm not. Do you, you no, no piano lessons, no theory, no... I, I took piano lessons and the teacher ran out of the house. <laughs> she, she said, Mrs. Herman, I don't know what to do with him. Uh, I was trying to learn the happy farmer or, you know, da da, ba ba, ba 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 ba. And she played it for me. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I can do that. And I sat at the piano and played exactly what she played. I had never heard it before. Really? Just because I have that, that, year, yeah. that gift, and that's a gift. That's nothing that uh, I deserve credit for. That's something that I was born with. Well, if you have the gift for the music, is it a gift you also have for the lyrics, or do the lyrics take you more effort, more blood, sweat, and Lyrics tears? are much more difficult to write, I think, for anyone mm -hmm. than, than, than music. But what has happened to me is that I think of them as one thing. I don't think of myself as a, as a, as a, a man who writes poetry mm -hmm. or a man who writes music. I think of myself as a songwriter mm -hmm. because they happen simultaneously in my case. Mm. And, um, and that's why you never sought a lyricist partner when you were starting out. Oh, no. When you would write a song, you would come up with the... Uh... In fact, the interesting... Uh, uh, truth is that I've received more Best Lyricist Awards than I have com Best Composer Awards. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Your songs are, are very well constructed. I wonder if your training as an architect or designer influenced you in some way as a, as a composer just in the construction of a song or even the construction of a show because your shows are brilliantly constructed too. I do think that the two art forms are very similar mm. because they all use hundreds of different elements that have to come together to make one new thing. Mm -hmm. And when I'm designing a home, I have to think about the finished product before I go out and buy a sofa hmm. or before I find a paint chip. I have to know what that finished room is going to look like. And it's exactly the same with, with the musical. Really? So you see what MAME looks like I, before you start writing before a Before you hire Angela Lansbury, right? I, <laughs> knew, <laughs> I knew what the Dolly number was going to look like. I had hoped that it would look like what it looked like. And then Gower Champion, God bless him, yeah. heard my, my, my vision of it and put it on the stage twice as effectively as what I told him. Mm. But I told him that I saw a, a, a film once early in my life called Lillian Russell with <laughs> Alice Faye, mm. yes. and that she sang in a restaurant, mm. and the waiters joined her. And I said, they all had these white aprons on, and I said, I see Dolly coming down a staircase in flaming red, and the waiters, and I described this whole scene to him, and his eyes got like saucers, and then of course, a couple of months later, I saw that in front of my eyes in, in Detroit, and it was overwhelming because when you have a vision like that, you don't always end up seeing that on, on the stage. Yeah. But I did with, with, with Gower. Uh, now, Hello Dolly came after 
uh, mil milk and honey. Yeah. And and it was was it David Merrick who approached you, having seen milk and honey, and brought you into uh, yes, and that's an interesting story because David Merrick kind of summoned me to his office. You know, you do you just are told to arrive at David Merrick's office, and it was the most intimidating office I have ever walked into. And of course, that was his ploy. You're right. Yeah. He wanted to sit there, and this man with a with a black black hair and black mustache and dark eyes <laughs> looking kind of satanical it was sitting behind a desk surrounded by all this red and this young scared kid and I really was I was absolutely petrified of this man mm. now, now wasn't he a little worried because he thought you were an ethnic composer <laughs> that's the first thing he said to yeah. me he said I saw your show and I think you're very talented but I don't know if you're American enough <laughs> Well, I mean, you can't say that to me. I had two parents who were teachers in the the New York school system. I mean, I mean, it, I I said American enough. There's nobody more apple pie and Abe Lincoln than I am, and I and he looked at me skeptically, and I knew I had to prove it to him. Mm. So I said, "Do you have any kind of material that I could look at?" And he went to his shelf and he pulled out uh, a little sc uh, script, and it said on the cover, Matchmaker Draft Number One. Mm. It's my most precious possession. Oh, you have it, yeah. I have it. Mm. Dog-eared now, but it's, <laughs> it's so precious to me because that's what I read that night until the wee hours, and I started to work on on four songs. Really? What four songs did you work on? I wrote Put On Your Sunday Clothes exactly as you know it and exactly as it appeared in the show. Mm. I got so excited by the imagery of, of the period mm. and, and the Thornton Wilder line that Mike Stewart had very wisely kept in his version mm. of, of this. Put On Your Sunday Clothes, Barnaby. We're going to New York. And ah. it just said That's everything it, yeah. to me. Yeah. And I knew that that was a song, and I and I, I started to think about horses, hooves, and I went da dum ba dum bum bum ba, and that song just flew out. It, 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 it honestly flew out of me. It was frightening, mm. because I wanted this job like the guy in chorus. <laughs> I wanted it so badly. And what other song? And then I wrote the opening number. I wrote I put my hand in because I wanted to settle with the audience what Dolly was about instantly. I, I, I didn't want them to have to get used to the fact that she was a busybody and that she mixed in everything, that she, her, that she fixed people up. Right. That was her right. you know, profession. So I wrote that, and I wrote Call on Dolly as a counterpoint to that. And then I wrote the whole dancing sequence mm. because there was a lovely section in the script where uh, Dolly taught Cornelius had a dance. Yeah, wonderful. How David's long did song. it take you? When did you go back to David Merrick? Four days. Four later. days later. <laughs> and Merrick loved the songs? He loved the songs and he loved, I think even more than the songs, the fact that I was able to do them that quickly. Yeah. Right, right. But what is amazing to me, Jerry, is that just to hear you, you know, how you conceived of um, put on your Sunday clothes and, and I put my hand in here thinking this is what I want to establish with, with this character. These are things I would think that someone who works in the musical theater would have to sort of develop over time, you know, trial and error, experimentation, these sort of basic rules of the writing musical. You seem to have grasped them instantly. I think that's part of the gift that I was given to, to just know what to musicalize and what not to musicalize. That is as important as knowing how to do it. Mm -hmm. You can't. So so often I'll go to a to a show and I'll hear a song that I know is not the highlight of that scene, mm -hmm. and then the, the the great moment comes in the scene, and there's no song there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, boy, you goofed. You you know you know. Yeah. You have to know what to what to, what to turn into music. What is the emotional 
high point of, right. of, of the city. Would you mind uh, playing us uh, out on oh, the piano? I'd love to. I'd love to. Terrific. Jerry, you said to uh, put on your Sunday clothes just flowed right out of you. Can you, can you show us how that happened? It, <laughs> I started with... Uh, uh, just thinking about the sound of horses' hooves in, 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 in 1890. <laughs> and... Put on your Sunday clothes when you feel down and out. Strut down the street and have your picture took. Dressed like a dream, your spirits seem to turn about. That Sunday shine is a certain sign that you feel as fine as you look. Jerry, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for being our guest tonight. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.